Many of the places, temples, monuments, and cities built by our ancient ancestors are still around for us to admire in the present day. However, admiring them doesn't tell us anything about how they were built. The construction techniques and technologies of our ancestors are still largely a mystery to us. And we can prove that with the ancient technological wonders you're about to see in this video. If the purpose of this video is to talk about ancient cultures and their fantastic technological achievements, it'd be wrong of us not to mention the ancient Inca culture of South America. How is it that they were able to cut a square aqueduct into a volcanic rock 1,000 feet above sea level 3,500 years ago in Chamis, Peru? It might even be the case that this is the work of an advanced civilization that came before the Incas but they've left no trace of themselves in the area to help us identify them. Even the name of the site, which is Cumbe Mayo, just means Thin River. It doesn't give us any clues about who created the oldest human-built structure in all of South America. The precisely carved aqueduct channels water from melting snow all the way down the mountain to the cities in the dry valleys below it. It's a work of ingenuity, and it makes us wonder whether the stone monks which are allegedly natural occurring 60-foot high volcanic pillars above the aqueduct, are truly natural in origin after all. There are many fairy tales and legends in Azerbaijan about the true origin and nature of the Maiden Tower in Baku. It's a shame that none of them seems to get us closer to the truth behind the building's existence. Baku is an old walled city, and the Maiden Tower is the oldest structure in it. It's so old that nobody can say for sure when it was built or what it was called by the people who built it. Most educated guesses say that it's a 12th century construction, but there's a significant difference between the stones that make up the first three stories of the building and those that make up the rest. Those lower three levels are more likely to be 2,500 years old and possibly even more than that. That'd make the tower older than Islam meaning that if it's a religious building, it's more likely to have been put together by Zoroastrians. Alternatively, it could be an observatory. The stone protrusions that jut out from the tower correlate to the upper and lower levels of the lunar cycle. The name Maiden's Tower comes from a legend about a king's daughter leaping to her death from the top of the tower to avoid an arranged marriage. But there's no historical evidence to support this. There are several names for our next site. They're most commonly referred to as the Rock Sculptures of Abbe Fower. But you might also have heard them called the Sculptured Rocks of Rothano, or La Rochere Sculptes. You'll find them on the coast of Brittany in St. Malo, France. Abbe Fower lived in the 19th century, but suffered a severe stroke at the age of 30, depriving him of use of one side of his body and leaving him deaf and mute. He became a hermit and lived among the cliffs of Rothano, using the one good side of his body to carve bizarre shapes into the rocks. He started in 1870 and continued for more than 25 years. It's thought that he also created an underground gallery of wooden figures, but they were almost entirely destroyed by a fire in 1944. There are over 300 unique stone sculptures at the site, many of which are said to have been inspired by folklore tales of a pirate family called the Rothanovs, after whom the area is named. They were fishermen and smugglers of the 15th and 16th centuries, said to have superhuman eyesight that allowed them to see across the sea for miles. The tales are fanciful, but the sculptures are fantastic, especially when you bear in mind they were created by a one-armed man. Let's move on to something truly mind-blowing in terms of both sophistication and size. We're talking about the Yangshan Quarry in China, which is where most of the stone used in Nanjing's great monuments was quarried. Not all of the stone that was quarried, cut, and shaped here was moved elsewhere, though. Some of it, like its colossal unfinished steel, is still here. History tells us that the creation of the steel was ordered by the Yongli Emperor during the 15th century, who wanted to use it in a monument to honor his father at the Ming Shaoling Mausoleum. Workers got around to carving out the head, base, and body of the steel before appearing to give up, no doubt somewhat overawed by the size of their creation. 
The body is 30 feet wide, 15 feet thick, and 150 feet tall. We have almost no idea how they could possibly have carved something so enormous, and there's zero chance they'd ever be able to transport it. We can't help but wonder what convinced them that such a thing might have been possible in the first place. Discovering how to manufacture and mold steel was an important technological breakthrough for our ancestors, but when did that breakthrough occur? Evidence suggests that it happened far earlier than the history books suggest. We say that because there's evidence of metal clamps being used on several ancient temples and megaliths as far apart as Cambodia, Peru, and ancient Egypt, dating back thousands of years. Archaeological evidence suggests that small metal clamps were used to hold large stone blocks together, even in buildings as famous as the Parthenon in Athens. But historians tend to gloss over the evidence because they can't explain it. The clamps' imprints can clearly be seen on several adjoining stones in significant ancient buildings, as is obvious in these images. But the steel itself is long gone. The most likely explanation is that the material was either stolen or used in other construction projects long after the megaliths were built. But the imprints remain in place as evidence that they were once there. Analysis of what appears to be clamp imprints at Puma Punca has revealed traces of platinum, a metal that only becomes liquid at temperatures of over 1700 degrees Celsius. How did our ancient ancestors even get it that hot? Never mind using it in their construction projects. Human beings first began deliberately harvesting olive oil approximately 5,000 years ago. The process works by growing olive trees, harvesting the olives each September, crushing them in a press, and then collecting the golden juice that flows out. In ancient times, olive oil was used for almost everything. It was cooking oil, but also lighter fluid. It was used to make soap, but also to make medicine. Even today, olive oil is the most essential ingredient in most Middle Eastern cuisines. The processes involved in creating olive oil evolved over time, and we can see the remains of one of the most sophisticated ancient oil presses in what's left of a four-roomed house close to the palace of Tel Hazor in Israel. Parts of the ancient machine have been reconstructed, so the process can be demonstrated to tourists but the core of the oil press is approximately 2,800 years old. It's a lever-based press of a kind that would remain in common use for the next eight centuries. Stone weights push the lever down, exerting force over a flat stone, which crushes a basket full of olives. It might look primitive, but it was effective. There's quite a lot of scientific guesswork involved in the dating the Gopashal rock-cut chain monuments in Madhya Pradesh, India. The carvings, which are sometimes also known as the Gopashal Parvat Jaina monuments, might have been created as long ago as the 7th century. Alternatively, they might have been carved as recently as the 15th century. The fact that scientists can't be any more accurate than that is a sign of how little we know about these beautiful decorations which appear on the walls of Gwalior Fort. Experts tell us that the majority of the carvings depict Tirthankaras in a traditional seated Padmasana pose, although there are others that show him in a standing posture known as Kayotsarga. All of the sculptures are nudes, which is the norm with Jain iconography. Jain rock shrines exist elsewhere in India, but none with as many monumental statues as this site. It's almost as if the Jains tried to turn the entire cliff into one enormous shrine. History records that the Mongol Emperor Babar ordered the statues to be mutilated in 1527, but the Jain community eventually restored them by adding new stucco heads. Our next ancient curiosity is also known by more than one name. Most people refer to it as the Tomb of Absalom but it's also sometimes called Absalom's Pillar. Whichever name you prefer to call it by, you'll find it in the Kidron Valley of Jerusalem. Mystery surrounds the origins of this monumental rock-cut tomb, which is notable because of its conical roof. The association with Absalom, son of King David, comes from ancient tradition. Modern archaeologists and scientists say that no such association is possible, 
Absalom is said to have lived and died about 3,000 years ago, whereas the tomb can't have been built any earlier than the first century. Also, only the lower half of the monument is a tomb. The upper half is a nephesh, a kind of funeral monument, and likely commemorates people buried in the adjacent caves as well as whoever was buried in its lower half. The burial chamber actually contains three burial sites, but we don't know actually who was buried in any of them. Absalom's pillar was clearly built for people of great importance, but we might never know who those people were. We've been to France once already in this video, but we're going back there now to show you an incredible underground church. Building a church underground is far harder than building one above the ground for obvious reasons, but perhaps ancient builders saw working on such a project as the ultimate demonstration of their faith. Whatever the reasons, their work led to the creation of the underground church of St. Jean, which is in abatur sur -Drona. It's the largest underground church in all of Europe. Scientists and archaeologists tell us that the whole church was carved by hand into a solid rock hillside during the 12th century. The style of the church is a little rustic, which is understandable given the methods used to create it, but the scale is impressive. Its main room contains two enormous columns supporting a 60-foot high ceiling, and a hand-carved stairway allows visitors to climb the entire back wall and claim a stunning bird's-eye view of the site from above. Experts think that the church was originally built as a semi-secret hiding place for important religious artifacts. The Roman reliquary in the largest side room is said to be a relic of the First Crusade, and the 80 sarcophagi in the other side room are said to contain the remains of saints and martyrs. Both claims are impossible to prove. There is no correct answer to the question, what color is the Lycurgus Cup? It could be one of two colors, depending on which direction you look at it from and how well lit it is at the time you're looking. The 1600-year-old curiosity has been intriguing all of those who've seen it for centuries. The cup was made using dichroic glass, which can reflect light particles in a variety of different ways. If a light is shown from behind the glass, it'll appear green, but if the light is shown from directly in front of it, the color turns red. It's almost certain that the person who made it understood the principles of the glass that they were using, even if they didn't know why it behaved in the way that it did. Archaeologists have never found anything else like it, which perhaps isn't a surprise, given how delicate the cup is. So we can't rule out the possibility that only one ancient Roman craftsperson ever understood the potential for the glass and how to make beautiful things out of it. When they died, the secret of how to make objects like this went to the grave with them. Seen from above, this incredible invention in Gonabad, Iran looks like nothing more significant than a series of puckered holes in the ground. That's misleading. This is actually one huge interconnected structure known as a Kiriris. It's an ancient miracle of hydraulic engineering. It's one of the greatest surviving examples of an irrigation system known as a conit, a form of water transportation technology that's still used in some parts of the world today. Faced with life on a dry plain 3,000 years ago, the ancient Persians knew that the only way to survive was to make water come to them. And that's what Kiaras does. The system is made up of underground tunnels that run for miles, connecting wells to underground reservoirs. The holes visible from above provide ventilation to the tunnels and also provide access for water collection. Building just one average-sized conit would take many years, as all the work was done with picks and shovels. Building something the size of Kiris must have taken decades. Systems like this still exist in Libya, Turkmenistan, Iran, and Afghanistan. We've looked at some large-scale mysteries during this video. Our final piece of mysterious technology is much smaller, but no less worthy of inclusion. If you're only taking a brief glance at it, you'd assume that the 2200-year-old sculpture is just one of many ancient Egyptian carvings of birds. Look closer, though, and you'll see that aside from the eyes and the beak, it has a lot more in common with a modern plane than it does with any bird we've ever seen. The wings are thin, 
straight, tapered, and devoid of feathers. The tail is square, too. If it just happened to look like a plane, we could write these things off as coincidence. But the sculpture is also aerodynamically perfect. A research team made a perfectly scaled up version of the sculpture during the 1970s and demonstrated that it was capable of flying and gliding. Is this an out of place artifact or was there an Egyptian toy maker somewhere who made their child a flying toy? Little realizing that they'd invented a test model aircraft over 2000 years ahead of schedule. Subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications and you will be the first to know when a new video comes out. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video.